Good afternoon and welcome to week six of 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Conversations from Jamaica to the World. My name is Magdalene F., co-founder and co-artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts. We are an international theater production company that creates plays, concerts, talks, and processes for making plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. This series is presented in partnership with Raw Management Agency, an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups across all genres in film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. We are very grateful to work in collaboration with Ms. Nadine Rollins, um, Raw Management's Managing Director and Co-Creator of this series. 
10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World, is a talk series that shares the behind the scenes stories of Jamaica's theater community with the global theater community and members of the Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora. Each week, Jamaica's leading theater pioneers and practitioners narrate their histories and memories of the Jamaican stage and offer their visions for the future development of theater in this 21st century. The series is made possible by our sponsor and publisher, HowlRound.com, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide that amplifies progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and facilitates connections between diverse theater practitioners. 10 Weeks in Jamaica is also sponsored by the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the City University of New York in Manhattan. The Siegel Center is home to theater artists, scholars, students, performing arts managers, and the local and international performance communities. Now, whether you are joining us for the first time or you have been watching weekly since we started this series on November 1st, we thank you very much for being in our audience today and hope that you will return weekly through the end of the series on January 3rd. I'd like to invite you to click the subscribe button to become part of our growing family. And while you're at it, go ahead and click that bell below to be notified of upcoming episodes and engagements from our channel. And hey, go ahead and follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We are Akiba Abaka Arts on all platforms. Now, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my partner, Machaji, co-founder and co-artistic director, Akiva Abaka, a distinguished director, dramatist, producer, actor, arts educator. Man, Akiva has been bringing theater to diverse communities throughout her 20 plus year career. All of that. Be your host and moderator for today's conversation. Welcome, Akiba. Thank you, Ms. Magali. You are most welcome, my dear. And we both share quite a storied career. Uh, <laughs> Co-founder Ms. Magali is a teacher with Boston Public Schools. And being a teacher and a theater director working with young people, I know you're going to really appreciate today's conversation with the playwright. Like, I mean, man, you have no idea how much I cannot wait to learn. It's always fun to just continue to learn, right? And I'm I'm looking forward to today's conversation. So we, we have a running bet going. Is the theater the domain of the writers, the actors, the directors, or the producers? I think the dom it's the domain of the writers, but that's because I'm partial to the writers. <laughs> right, right. I had to think about that. I don't know. Oh, you're giving me something to think about. Maybe I'll have an answer for you by the end. Awesome. Thanks, Magalie. All right. So is the theater the domain of the playwright, the people, or the prose, the common language of the people? Or does it encompass all of the above? What is the playwright's role in the formation of culture and a national narrative? Today's conversation centers on Jamaican play on the Jamaican playwright and their contribution to the narratives of the Jamaican people. This is a two-part series, which will continue next week, and it features a small sample of Jamaican playwrights because there are a multiple multitude of Jamaican playwrights in the country and in its diaspora. As a point of entry for today's conversation, we are referencing a statement by renowned Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw, when he visited Kingston in 1911. He stated that the next thing you want is a theater with all the ordinary traveling companies from England and America sternly kept out of it. For unless you do your own acting and write your own plays, your theater will be of no use. It will in fact vulgarize and degrade you. In this statement, Shaw was giving his recommendation as to how the country could overcome colonialism. Our guests today will give their own views on Shaw's statement and share how the work that they and their colleagues produce advances Jamaican culture. 
Playwright producer Basil Dawkins celebrates over 30 years of success in the theater. His journey started as a student at the University of the West Indies, where he acted in the Interhall Drama Festival. Since that experience, he has been an award, since, since that experience, he developed and honed his skills in writing, becoming an outstanding multi-award winning playwright, known for writing engaging drama and comedy, at times successfully combining both. He has cemented his position as one of the most talented and entertaining playwrights to emerge from the Jamaican stage. Basil Dawkins was recognized by the Institute of Jamaican uh, the, by the Institute of Jamaica in 2004, when he received the prestigious Musgrave Award for his achievements as a playwright and for his contributions to the development of Jamaican theater. Welcome, Basil. Hey, Akiba, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being with us. Born in England to Jamaican parents, Fabian M. Thomas is an adjunct lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of the West Indies at Mona. He, is, he serves as a transformational trainer and facilitator, life and corporate coach, poet, word, spoken word artist, actor, and published writer. He studied communication and literature at the University of the West Indies at Mona, and then went on to earn his master's degree in public communications from Fordham University in New York. He is the founder and artistic director of the performing arts ensemble, Tribe Sankofa, which by the way, they are celebrating their eighth anniversary at this moment. Through his work as a social and behavioral change communications consultant, Sabian brings much needed attention to HIV prevention and awareness, youth development, and corporate and social advancement for individuals. Sabian is the host of a YouTube talk show, Sabian Set, and is the co-host of a parenting podcast, She Has Kids, He Doesn't. Welcome, Sabian. Greetings from Kingston, Jamaica. Good to be here. Good to be here, Akiba. Basil, what a one. Peace and love, my brother. <laughs> we are alive. <laughs> Baby, and I'm going to steal your greetings. You say greetings and salutations. Greetings yes. and salutations. <laughs> so nice to see you. Thank you for being here. With a theater career spanning almost 27 years, David Tullock is an all-rounder in the performing arts. In addition to his more than 100 plays, he has 13 original scores to his credit and appeared in over 200 productions, including The Lion King, For My Daughter, and Across the Bridge with the legendary Leone Forbes. He was also a member of the cast of Jamaica's longest running soap opera, The Blackburns of Royal Palm Estate. He played the notorious role of Sobers. <laughs> David has won over 13, David has won 13 Active Boy Awards, seven Thespi Spirit Awards, and three Methuen Awards. He is the general manager and proprietor of the Phoenix Theater Company and lectures at the University of the Commonwealth of the Caribbean. Welcome, David. Thank you, Akiva. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Gentlemen, big up for yourself. <laughs> yes. Hi. Yes. David, if you could turn your um, your camera on. Yes, there is your wonderful face. <laughs> so starting off this conversation, just to get a little bit of a background on your work and when and where you each enter the theater and hold this incredible title of playwright. Basil, you went to school to study government and the theater captured you. Number one, how did your parents react? And <laughs> number two, um, what has that transition been like to go from an interest in politics and service into service through the arts? Uh, let, let me start at the beginning where I actually, I'm a rural man. I, I originated from way down in Westmoreland, which is almost the other end of the capital. capital. So when I came to the university as almost adult, are wanting to be adult. 
uh, it was my first visit into the city. And part of the reason I was here was the fact that I was attending the University of the West Indies, so I was a freshman. Now, part of the presentation for freshmen during those days was, among the things, a play called Smile Orange by Trevor Rowe. And that was the, I was forced to see it because as a freshman, you had no choice. And I reluctantly went. And when I sat, it was an experience that such I've never had before. My experience of theater before was something at the church or at the school. So this was a very professional offering. And I looked at it and I said, I like that. I think, I think I could do that. But just having watched it and totally mesmerized, totally impressed, on my way back to the hall where I lived, I convinced myself that it was not my thing. So Freshman's Week is over. Now it's time for inter-hall theater competition. I was pushed into a crowd scene. I got in it. I had one line. I studied like Shakespeare sonnet. I got my line all together. My girlfriend was in the full auditorium and I heard somebody say my line while I was on stage. Only to find out after that I had frozen so badly, I never even knew what was happening. And in order for the play to go on, somebody had to, had to say the line. And that was my baptism. But after that, it was straight a love affair that continues until today. Awesome. David, your trajectory is a little bit in the reverse of Basil's in the sense that you're entering or looking to enter into the world of politics, but you, you are a, a child of the stage, a child of the theater who really grew up to become quite, you know, the kind of dawn of the Jamaican stage, you know, in, in your in your age group, I should say. I know Fabian is laughing, but you're quite a <laughs> accomplished with somebody at your age. Tell us about this transition for you and when and where. Well, well, I don't have an illustrious story like most people. Um, as a young teenager, um, I got involved in musical theater first um, as a performer. I really joined because it was a really good idea coming from an all boys school like Ulmer's to get involved in a cast of 63 with only 10 of us being guys. Um, Fabian knows because Fabian was a part of that company as well, Jamaica Musical Theater Company. Um, and I, 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 I was so smitten by the amount of girls that were in the show that I said, maybe this is some place to stay. You know, this is awesome. And everybody's so friendly and everybody's so huggy, huggy and kissy, kissy. And I mean, <laughs> at 14, wow. And then, you know, I, I was lightweight champion of Jamaica at the time in, in, in karate. And um, I had a lightweight boat at Pegasus and I, I skipped it just because I had a rehearsal because there are so many girls that it was going to be there, not to mention choreography, where everybody's like in a leotard, like, oh my God. I mean, this is like coming out of, and then I continue this way. Like, I, I used to come home from school and bathe again just because I had rehearsals and you had to be impressive because somebody's going to hug you today. Um, and then one day the director came to me and said, Listen, you have some talent, you know. And I was like, Really? I was really, this was like a social club. And when he said that, uh, Peter Haley, a blessed memory. Um, I then started to pay attention to what I was doing on stage now rather than the socializing. Um, then it led up to Lion King, which probably was one of my hallmark moments in theater at SCAR. Um, being nominated for the Actor Boy Award for the first time in a category with Oliver Samuels and Alwyn Scott and all these people. It was like, oh my gosh, I, maybe I could do this. And then JMTC got slapped with the copyright law. Um, so we couldn't do... Broadway shows like that again. And so David was asked to write it because, I mean, I just started. I can't end my career here. I would, mm -hmm. If I have to write it, I would. And I wrote my first musical, my first play, my first script for Jamaica Musical Theatre Company. Mm -hmm. 27 years later, um, I've, my father is, used to be a former minister of tourism, and I... I watch him in service and I realize one thing that the theater and politics have in common is one of my greatest passions. 
people. I love people. I love people for people. I love their different personalities, their attitudes, the way they relate, the way they get upset. And so that transition to help and want to serve came from that angle. But I'm still a playwright. I'm still a performer in the arts. With just COVID, you can't, you can't do what you want to do because you just have to transition. Well, you know, I always say if you were trained as a doctor and you are not practicing medicine, you're still a doctor. So COVID, COVID is, is here for a little while and taking up a lot of our space and in, in, in the, you know, closing down our theaters, but we're still practitioners and we're still professionals. Okay. So transitioning is also a huge part of your life, Fabian, in the sense that you were also trained in communications and then transitioned into um, communications and government. And then you transitioned to a, into a life of the arts, made quite a name for yourself as a playwright and then continued on to create an ensemble and to work in corporate Jamaica to take the skills and the trainings um, of, a, of theater to corporate Jamaica to help um, employees and, and staff build um, equitable workforces. Yes. And, and also the work you're doing with Tribe Sankofa around youth development and training young people to go into the creative sector. Yes. Tell us about this transition for you as well. And where does the life of the playwright begin for you? So interestingly, I wouldn't necessarily call it a transition for me if I was always yes. a performer as a kid, yes. running around, telling stories, reading, singing into spoons and um, reading out loud. So that was always, I was always kind of very active kid. Loved literature, loved stories, loved reading. I remember in high school, one of my literature teachers used to say, you know, well, Fabian and I will talk about the book since he's the only one who read it. <laughs> and sometimes when my classmates were struggling through their first reading, if I liked a book, I was on my second reading. And, and I'd, I'd come and say, but miss, on page so and so and so, they said so and so and so and so. How can so and so and so? So sometimes, especially in sixth form, it would be me and my literature teacher, almost like the two of us having a conversation. I say to people now, think formulas I learned in science subjects and things. Maths, if you test me now on maths, when I learn it, 90. Ask me next week, gone. Books I read in first form, literature books, I remember. And a, a big part for me with working with youth is help, helping people figure out what their passion is, what they're good at. Went through high school, got tricked into performing um, at Calabar by well, my best friend at the time. There was an inter-hall competition. And he said, if you were up there singing, what song would you sing? So I said, maybe She's Out of My Life by Michael Jackson. Was leaving the chapel to go and buy a soda and heard the MC announce my name because that wicked boy went and told her, Fabian Thomas from Athens is going to sing She's Out of My Life. Get up on the stage and like Basil, I don't remember a thing. I closed my eyes, but I sang. And when I was done, everybody stood up. And that was my first taste of performing for an audience. The first um, went on to do plays, <laughs> joined the choir, went to UE, UDAS, um, University Singers. My father used to say to me, "You why don't just move your bed to Philip Sherlock because you live down there? I was student coordinator two years. Yeah, man, I was student coordinator two years in a row. Literally, sometimes Scotty used to have to come and knock on the student coordinator door to tell me he wants to lock up the theater. <laughs> So I was always immersed in it. But now, as you said, the link now between my training and facilitation. So I'm a dramatic presenter. I use skits, I use role plays, I engage people, which also fed into my work in HIV as a, as a social worker, but also animating things for, 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 for clients and patients to understand, but also about transformation. How do you use our culture, our work, and people's liberty and their reality to, to shift, to impact people. So for me, it's always been connected. And now that I'm doing a lot more writing as a writer, it, the, 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 I, I believe there are no accidents. Um, so I'm I'm artist, thespian culture through and through and through and through. I know that's part of why I'm here and grateful. Excellent. Thank you so much, gentlemen. So jumping into the conversation here, we've heard the quote, we've read it, we've seen it. And what we're really looking at is where, where is the narrative? Where is the story of um, the Jamaican people? And what are your thoughts on, on Shah's quote? And what would he see and what would he think of the theater in Jamaica today? Were he to be here? Not to center him, just to use him as 
uh, jumping off point. Do you want me to start? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, essentially, I think he made a pointed observation at the time that we should guard ourselves culturally from, from colonialism as it was then. And I think somebody, somebody listened and it had some kind of resonance because shortly after we, Jamaica got its independence in 1962, in 1963, the government established a festival office and the responsibility and charge of that festival office was to ensure that it made available avenues for all cultural forms and expressions. Mm -hmm. And as a result today, we have the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission that sponsors, trains, invite, encourages all aspects of cultural offerings from all people. And it, it, it's, it's school-based, it's adult-based, it's, it's very encompassing. And as a result, I would say that we have a very strong performance, theater, creative culture. And we somehow have not been afflicted by any overseas troops coming to exploit us or to make money of us. But in fact, it's a kind of colonialism in reverse because we go to, this, to the metropolitan centers and perform. So essentially, Mr. B had a point and somebody listened. You know, when we were briefing about it earlier, um, one of the responses is that Shaw was quite radical in his statement. Because not only is he talking about, because if we're thinking about when the statement was made in 1911, we're looking at just about, what, four years after the great earthquake of 1907, mm -hmm. and Kingston is rebuilding. So the Ward Theater hasn't opened yet, and much of the infrastructure of Kingston, as we know it, is not there. Um, also, theater in Jamaica at the time, the mainstream theater, was mainly narratives from Western European culture. So we had a lot of Shakespeare, we had a lot of mainly, it was mainly theater for the gentrified. There were, we know Brian Heap came and spoke with us on week one. And we do know, do know that African Jamaicans were making theater and telling their stories, but not necessarily on a mainstream stage. So as far as the evolution, the evolution from, um, theater from a Western European canon to a Jamaican canon. Um, Fabian, tell us where we are with the Jamaican canon today, as far as if we were to answer um, Shaw's statement in that way. Yeah, Shaw, I, I, again, I agree with Basil. Shaw was spot on because there's something about achieving or trying to maintain some level of purity and autonomy in your expression. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, all, we have creolization and syncretism and the cultures mixing and fusing but it's, it's, it's creating a new expression. And one of the things I find in working with young people, also not so young people, is saying, who are we? What we are say? Mm -hmm. What do we have to say? What is our narrative structure? When we are tell a story and, and we say, me say the house big so, and we're using our whole body to show that the, the man head was as big as the room. And we're using, and you know, how does a, a Caribbean or Jamaican woman when she put her hand on her hip, what happens to the body? When a, when a, when a country woman or your grandmother or a market woman laps her skirt in between her legs and put the basket there. Lap our crack tail, as we say. Lap your crack <laughs> tail. When we draw a long bend. So even, all those things for me have fed into us telling our stories and, and, and using the Jamaican narrative and the Jamaican rhythms and cadences, which are so important. And again, the beautiful thing that, you know, as it, when, we were, when we talked, Akiba, I, I went and looked at that, 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 that Shaw quote. And then, as you said, he said that in 1911. Yes. In 1912, the World Theatre was built. You know, 1940, Henry and Rita Fowler started Little Theatre Movement. 1961, Little Theatre is built. And as Basil mentioned, 1963, JCDC. So interestingly, a couple of colleagues of mine who are here from Trinidad now, 
Um, I'm going to even jump in a little bit because 19 was it 1965 Theater 77 that was, and then from Theater 770 becomes um, Barn 77, and those two theaters are very very important in the evolution. Big time. Kind of, but I'll let you finish, and then we'll get into that. Right, and so colleagues of mine, Camille Comina and Marvin George, mm -hmm. two of my people, my people there, if we love them one more time, you know, when I met them, I, I have this thing that some people, when I meet them, my soul recognizes them. And my soul recognized Camille and Marvin, and I interviewed them for Fabian Say. And Camille said, you know, as much as we in Jamaica, we complain and we have issues and things now going on, and the money now run, she was saying to us, in the region, Jamaica is the Holy Grail because we have institutions. Mm -hmm. Things were set up in Jamaica, our forefathers, at independent say, mm -hmm. we need a JCDC, mm -hmm. we need a national gallery, we need an Institute of Jamaica, and they're saying, they look to us as saying, these people have institutions that are archiving, and I'm thinking, wow, it's true, because when you go back to look and research about, as you said, the early storytellers, you know, um, Bim and Bam and Miss Lou and Mass Ran and Pantomime and the theater before, you know, as you said, the African Jamaicans who were telling stories, not on the mainstream stage, what were they saying? How, how were they saying it? And then diffusing now with pantomime, borrowing from the, the British tradition, but Jamaicanizing it and mm -hmm. infusing it with Jamaica and then roots theater emerging and saying, okay, so classical theater or professional theater in Jamaica is mimicking European style we're going to mash up the box. Okay. <laughs> we're going to kick down the fourth wall and we're going to talk to the audience. <laughs> and we're going to put microphones so with the actor there in you know, the big space, walk up to the mic and talk to them. When I heard the first week, I was like, what is going on? What is this? And then it was like, wait a minute, they're doing, they're creating something. They're going to mash up the box. And they built an audience in a way that commercial theater in Jamaica had not. And we did vex. We didn't vex because we said, look, look how people are flocking to their play. And it's, 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 it's not following the rules of theatre. And people are talking to the audience. And then some people who went to those plays now come to the commercial theatre with the fourth wall and are talked to the actor them. <laughs> they wanted to answer. So we had to do a, a breathe and step back and say, there's a space for Roots Theatre. And it may not be my thing, but it is a thing. And it is a thing that should not be discounted because in the story of Jamaican theater and creativity, there's space for everybody. When Sistrine was doing them thing, they were seen as rebel and they were and they were seen as vulgar because they were talking about pregnant women and women having an period. But Sistrine changed the world of development theater mm -hmm. and applied theater. But in the day, people were like, what is that vulgarity? Just like early reggae, it was some boogoo boogoo, natty ed, get a youth music. It wasn't respected at first. So I think as practitioners, we have to remember and stay true to what is the expression I'm trying to capture? How am I honoring the story and the cadence? You know, when our when country, when our inner city woman, our youth who police beat up, our youth who know the school, our youth at the stoplight, how do I tell his story with grace and honor and recognize that it deserves to be on the stage? that deserves to be heard and that excites me and I think that range of voices and expressions in Jamaica that we're respecting more I think and making more space for and borrowing from each other is a big part of why Jamaican theatre is so vibrant and I'm honoured to be a part of it. And it's quite a fraternity and you know uh, David you we, we when we think about the contemporary Jamaican writers you are definitely one of the writers at the forefront and you, you, in a lot of ways, you sit in a, in a, in a very, um, in a generational space where you've received training from the classics, the LTMs, but you've also written for the Roots Theater. You wrote for um, Del Cita and Shibata um, at one point, additionally working in other forms of popular theater and also on television. So when you think about Shaw's statement as to, do we, do we now have a Jamaican theater? Well, um, I, I must say, Akiba, I'm honored to have worked in so many different disciplines of the theater form here in Jamaica. Um, it, it's been very colorful, and that's it. As a patriot, my thing is, Shaw was right. Shaw was right that 
a people, not just Jamaica, but a people on a whole, have to identify themselves as themselves. And the best way, as a theater practitioner, I know, is to have a, a national theater movement that, that, that supports that. Where I think it's important, now that you mentioned contemporary, it's the changing of the vanguard each time um, that we, I'm gonna use a pun, and I'm gonna say that we play our part. I know Latin plays, we play our part, but play our part in advancing the welfare of our whole human race to take something out of our national motto. Look, Sir Basil, I worked with Sir Basil as well. Um, Sir Basil gave me my first commercial um, experience on the stage in a gift for mom. And it's how he passed on the vanguard that, listen, youngster, there's going to come a time when you become me and this is the kind of way you need to do. Yes, I was a young rebel at times and there are things I wanted to do, but he was able to bring it in and say, look, man, you're doing it this way and I don't care if this way. And so I am able to pass that on as well. So who is defending the vanguard? Who is passing the baton? Has that responsibility to make sure that culture remains vibrant? Um, Jamaica, I believe, has one of the most colorful, if not the most colorful culture anywhere, anyway. And it's so much in demand by the rest of the world. There's so many people out there want to include us, want to be like us, want to do us. Um, I know Fabian, Basil and myself, we travel yearly with our products overseas because the demand for the diaspora that's actually in, in the foreign countries, it, 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 it's so high. So who we are passing on to has that responsibility to make sure there is still something passing on. As that's it, you know, it comes right back down to culture and Shaw was right. Let us not steal somebody else's culture. Let's not steal somebody else's way. I respect Shakespeare and everyone else that have made me the writer I am today. But I, I love the fact that within our country, we have our own voice. We have our own space and we are our own people. That is it. There is nowhere else um, in this world you're gonna find somebody like a Jamaican, as resilient, as colorful, and as daring and blaring as we are, we, we don't stop. The volume is low. You know, I want to jump in quickly and just claim yeah. it. So David, um, me and Chad, we're not traveling every year yet, but we're claiming that, my brother. <laughs> you need to be. <laughs> okay, you're sick of, we're not traveling every year yet. You're sick of 2021. You see that I included, you know. You see that I included. I'm glad I said, bless the Lord, <laughs> bless the Lord. But you know, the thing is, <laughs> We'll, we'll talk a little bit about COVID later on, uh, but I've been able to enjoy quite a bit of tribe's work through internet. And so this time, which is a time of shutdowns, I keep saying that 2020 is an opening, not a closing. And if we are aware and if we're present, Amen. We Amen. of the time, the opening of our time. So yes. speaking of, of openings, um, just, you know, you mentioned Sister in Theater, we are going to be speaking with uh, Lana Finnegan, who is one of the founders of Sistrin. You know, when I was in- Mama, Mama Lana. We, we had to study um, Sistrin Theater Company when we talked about um, community theater and, and theater for the people. We had to actually study Sistrin. So it's gonna be a huge honor to speak with Lana next week. So thank you for bringing her up. So let me ask you this, a question of aesthetics. What is the aesthetic of the theater that you create? When I come to see, where do you, want, mm -hmm, you know, when, when we, when I come to see works created by a David Tullock, a Fabian Thomas, a Basil Dawkins, where do you sit in the canon of Jamaican works? Well, well, well for, me, for me, it depends on what type of my show you're coming to see. Cause the, 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 the ratings differ from very, 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 G for all general audiences, and we can go straight up to over 21 and over. So it depends on the, I, I, you see, for me, I, I try to cater to everybody. So I have a piece, bits and pieces of my mind that travel into various genres. So I, I like to be catering to our people who like my gospel work, uh, people who love my kids' plays, uh, people who love my very, very adult plays. You know what I mean? So it depends on on what you want, what you like. I, I, there's something like that for everyone. I mean, certainly. So your work, 
you 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 have um you do work in the gospel genre and yes, then you definitely it for young audiences and then you have more contemporary adult um and then there's a very very adult there's a level above that very <laughs> very very <laughs> adult okay very clear <laughs> All right, Baza, what's the kind of, what is the aesthetic of the work that you create? Where, 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 what part of Jamaican society are you writing from? I, I think, I think essentially my work reflects the, 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 it has a kind of middle classness about it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it working middle class, it's basically drama that, that points to and looks at the carryings on of, ordinary people and those who end up doing extraordinary thing. I, I try, while not to be preachy, to at least reflect some kind of the moral high ground of, of the society, whatever that is at any given time. I also will sneak in provocative stuff that will force them the, my audience to think I, I want to look at things like spousal abuse. I look at 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 the the absentee father. I look on the effect of of the migration where where the productive part of the population has to go away, and then grandma or helper has to bring up the children and and all of the social ills that arise from those kinds of things. I also try to, on another level, encourage people to be forgiving to, because I find that there is not enough forgiveness in our society. And as a result, we are not achieving the, the level of gentleness and kindness that the society naturally has, but because we're unforgiving and we keep up things, things that shouldn't blow up into something that it's it's a minor thing but it blows up because we are unforgiving so essentially i would say that my my genre is 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 drama but richly laced throughout with comedy because in my head the, the, the drama is the medicine and the comedy is the sugar that mm -hmm. keeps it down you know we had um Valier johnson on uh two weeks ago and he talked about one of your pieces, Toy Boy, right? That was was yours. And he talked about playing um, a homeless man in that play. And work when you talk about the the this balance or the the what I call the taffy pull between comedy and drama, here we see um, as if you want to tell us a little bit more about Toy Boy, but the role that he played being a homeless man, people would see him, dirty homeless man, making fun of him. And then he's taken home by a woman who bathes him and, and, and takes care of him and helps him to kind of get back, get himself back up into society. Can you just give us a little taste of that narrative? And yes, where, essentially, and where that work? Um, Toy Boy was inspired by the fact it was during the time when when AIDS and HIV was a terrifying thing, you know, um, there was people felt if you if you got it, there was no outers for you. And this was a lady, an upper Saint Andrew middle class middle class lady whose husband is was believed to have died as a result of AIDS. And mm -hmm. although she was attractive, she was rich, she was everything. No man would touch her because. Her husband died from AIDS. And in her desperation, she just decided to live by herself. But then she went to, to maybe get gasoline in her vehicle, saw this homeless man. He came and he helped her to put gas in the car because that's something she never did before. And she just looked at him and smelly and decrepit and as he was, she decided I have nothing to lose. I'm going to take him and fix him up. So she took him home. She got him dentist work. She 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 trans is a Pygmalion, but with, with clothes rather than language, with right. clothes and appearance and designer this and that. Still, still the head space wasn't good, but he was so attractive to all the people in her circle. 
mm-hmm. that many people, many of his, her contemporaries, many of her girlfriends, actively tried to take him away from her. And um, none of them knowing his history, none of them knowing where he came from, but goes to show that her effort to build him back based only on superficialities mm. made him attractive to the society that considers itself so up and snooty and above everybody else. And there's so much commentary there, so much social Ex- commentary. Extremely, extremely. Oh, amazing. I would love to have seen a performance of that. And, yeah. and, and it's just two hander, it's just two actors. Hopefully I could see that in the future because it could get a revival. Yeah. So Fabian, when we talk about social commentary, you specifically <laughs> do work um, looking at H- HIV prevention and you work specifically with young people. Um, tell us about the aesthetics of your theater. What, what will we see when we come to your place? Wow, for me, I try to, for me, it's, it's about transformation. It's a transformative for me and healing space that's very important. Um, so it's looking at not just outward issues, but inward issues. And it's the same way I tried to go for functions as a space. Like I'm as interested in who, how we live in off stage as how, how we're performing on stage. I think the two things are, are, are strongly connected. So when you come, you're going to see us honoring work and words. So I love words, 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 with the sounds of words, how, page, how words look on a page, how they sound when you lift them off the page. Um, and how they evolve and morph into a whole other thing when you stage them. So poetry and prose work, and even in, in writing, you know, there's sections sometimes an actor has a monologue that, that takes on a different cadence. I've always been fascinated by that. So when people come, you're going to hear us honoring words and stories, but also things that are held up to say, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. And what, are, what do you have to heal? This character is healing this. What are you healing? What are you carrying? It's also very important to me to honor, to honor work and honor the show, honor those whose shoulders I stand on. Mm-hmm. So the, the directors who directed me early on, who made me want to direct, Earl Warner, Eugene Williams, Easton Lee, Bobby Gisays. I knew... I wanted to do this. This thing they were doing with me as an actor, I wanted to do that. But also this respect for writing and, 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 and deconstructing the work and then putting it back together. And then I had amazing literature teachers that informed my work. So it's looking at who are we at our core, but who are we in our soul, but also ancestrally. Um, honoring ancestors is very, very important to me. And as a result, you know, we have the show where, you know, where the ancestor spirit show up. <laughs> we have to bless the space and get effing and white up people's head. And, you know, because when you're called by ancestor, them say, oh, you call me? <laughs> See me here? <laughs> and he say, well, why is this happening? Because you call me name. Wow. Or you're telling my story. And even that having to work with young actors, but also not so young because here's what colonization and miseducation has done. Mm-hmm. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of our stories. And okay. Nancy is a, is, a, is a thief in Wiki. No, and Nancy outsmart Master. And Nancy outsmart animals bigger than him. It was and about Nancy survival. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's like, and Nancy's a criminal. Why are they teaching children? Like, really? And Nancy is us. And Nancy was this little Spider-Man who outsmarted animals 10 times his size. Mm. And Nancy was a survivor. Mm. And Nancy was a youth who should have been dead or squashed, but who survived. So those stories represent us. You and know, he's and- also, he's, and Nancy's also a part of African um, cosmology. He's the trickster. Yes. Our he's ancestors the, brought, the him the the brought him on the slave ship. They brought him on the slave ship with them. The he's stories came money. from yeah. Africa with them to us, but the yeah. same thing of, you know, anything black, no good, OBI right. is wicked, you know, speaking in tongues is bad, but if you're speaking in tongues in an anglicized church, it's okay. And I find that theater, we have to reclaim that, tell the story, sing the songs, rehearse the songs. That's why I have to bless up Olive Lewin, who went on with search, 
you know, Queenie, who went into a mild trance and came out speaking Kikongo, having never learned it before. Those things have always fascinated me. You know, NDTC, like, how could they have all these stories when people mild travel, Kumina, when they do Kumina, you know, lantern it, going to the hills, carry dancer in a bush. <laughs> <laughs> so till some people withdraw them, them daughter or son out of Lakatka, which I can't go to Portland for. Du, 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 du. You know, you go to a Naya Bingi, yeah. So you, for, for me, the steeping and immersing ourselves in the culture and mm -hmm. then now saying, how do we use this and access this in our stories, yeah. in our poetry? How do we how do we honor the work of, you know, Dennis Scott, Mervyn Morris, um, um, Lorna Goodison? How do we take our poets and writers and, and elevate them to the level where we are focusing on them. David said it earlier, every other major show, series that's done outside Jamaica, Jamaica show up at some point. Whether musically, them referring to the food, talking about being, we're a dot on the map, but yet, Such a big impact. It's, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. there's, there's greatness in us. And that for me, honoring that and showing that on stage in its fullness, musically, in terms of movement, poetry and drama, is, 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 is part of, is my brand, and is definitely the Tribe San Kofa brand. You know, so your work is really looking at honoring those who came before. The people that you named are some of the pillars of Jamaican theater, Jamaican yes. culture. Um, you also named Lentonette Steins, and mm -hmm. Lentonette Steins is, um, I would say she's more than a light bearer. She, she is so critical, and a major point of connection to, um, African dance to work, no. dance all around the world and then connecting to our contemporary dance form of dance hall. Yes. And, you know, so I, I, very, I, very call, I call Lantern it name with Alvin Ailey, Catherine oh. Dunham. Catherine Lantern, Dunham. For me, Lantern. Lantern, that's, that's exactly where Lantern it resides. When you look at the work she's done, but also some things that come out of Lantern it head. Because mm -hmm. I used to be in like, and I work with her and I said, Lantern it, will you? And she tell you, she dream it. She go sleep and wake up. I've seen London, and you think I've never seen this movement before anywhere on anybody. So, so and you know, prof method for that level of creating a vocabulary for a nation, for an expression. And I think now contemporary, as David was saying, what are we doing with that? How are we borrowing from that? But also what new things are we creating in this yeah. time? Let me jump in here. I want to jump in here because you're really touching and you're really touching, um, you're, you're actually laying out, uh, you both lay out um, in some ways the fabric of Jamaican society, right? You, you the, the middle class, the Anglo um, aspect, the, the different culture, cult, countries um, and cultures that are in, in Jamaica, but also everybody connects, no matter how much um, they say or don't say, everyone connects in Jamaica to the Afro-Jamaican narrative. Everyone connects to, to um, Kumina, whether or not you, you hide and say you, you've been to Anaya Bingi, or, well, not everyone can go to Anaya Bingi. Anaya Bingi, by the way, is a, 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 a drumming session among Rastafari people, or whether you, you know, been to a Poco church, been to a mile session, somehow, some way that Africanism is deeply rooted in Jamaican society. And you see it on the stage and you see it in the streets. I'm gonna to go to another playwright, Amiri Baraka, um, who's the Dutchman we're very familiar with, right? Leroy Jones. And starting this question with David, Amiri Baraka once said that the job of the playwright was to see what's going on in the streets and to put it on the stage so that the people can see what's going on in the streets. So what's going on in the streets of Jamaica that you are putting on the stage and in all, in, in all the, the three different genres that you're writing for, theater for young audiences, for gospel theater and theater for more mature audiences. What well, are we doing on the streets that is on, your, on the stage? Well, well, this is it, right? Um, I, I focus primarily on relationships, right? As I said, mm. it could be familial, could be marital, could be spousal, depending on whatever it is, we're looking at the relationship around my story. So right now, it's a, it's a pivotal time in the world. And I find that where we left off in theater just before COVID came, we were looking at things like, can, can a man lose 
their woman to a woman. That 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 because that's these are topics that people don't touch, but they're they're very much there. Um, I tend to be that writer that that touches the things that people are afraid of. So on the streets, you want to look at a case where we did not my child, which I took literally from something in the Gleena that I read of a relationship between a 14 year old girl and a 45 year old man. This was a true story. She asked for a phone and couldn't get it. She then threatened to tell his wife. And so he chopped her into 43 different pieces. Um, this, these are stories. And then guess what? We have gruesome stories like that generally, but what drew me to it was the fact that the Gleena reported that the mother knew that this relationship was going on and encouraged it because that's what paid their rent and their bills and all of that. And I'm saying, okay, here we go, David, as a writer, you have to touch this. Um, in, in something a little bit more mature, I looked at the sugar daddy effect. Literally, that was the name of the play. Um, the sugar daddy effect. Yeah, the sugar the daddy effect. <laughs> well, well, here is what happened. You are looking at a man who fell flat on his face. His wife literally abuses him mentally, verbally, and, you know, he's deprived of affection. And then he gets a helper to help out and they fall in love. And he then gives that, 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 that young girl all his attention and time and turns her life around. And in return, she turned his life around. And now the wife wants back. So there, there, these are issues like I've heard audience members saying, what well, it was just like being a fly on a wall. This is real. Real is important mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we all love to do a theater, but if it's not going to be viable, then it absolutely makes no sense to just do it. So you have to find these stories that resonate with people that intermission they're talking about it and they're arguing and this one is on that side that one is on that side and you're going back and forth and there's a twist coming if, if it's my play there are a couple of twists coming at you right away so um you don't know where what how and and it's it's just to, it's just to look around you because our music have brought us to this level where things are so graphic now um there's nothing left to the imagination again so as a writer i find myself having to match that and if you don't then what's the point in going look at what's being popular in entertainment now people go to parties they go to dances why the food is good the drink is good the socialization is good but the entertainment is music so you have to look at the music that they're listening to it's extremely graphic so if you're going to come to my play i have to give you something that is a little better or on par with the party that you're about to go to because entertainment has leveled. Movie prices are the same as theater tickets, as the same as, uh, as, as party prices. So we're all in this thing trying to make sure that you keep the same culture, same dancehall culture if you need that, same middle class culture if you need that. The mixture of both middle class meeting the working class, that's also very popular. And, and, and look at the dynamics. So you are, you are writing from what you know you make a good point about entertainment and the arts the arts sometimes always feels that they have to be in dialogue sometimes even in competition with with entertainment so there is a sense of you know the people are going to the dance hall the people are going to the nightclubs how do we get the people to come to the theater you know um so we then have to write um works that would get people who are interested in that culture to be interested in theater. Right. Not to cut you, Akiva. Um, yeah. I don't know if Sir Dawkins saw Sugar Daddy, but I know Fabian did. And you, you, <laughs> and you, you, you literally, um, you can't sell benefit performances for a play like that because it did have nudity in it, right? But it sold itself from a Tuesday to Sunday with double shows on Saturday and three shows on a Sunday, right? Um, I know... My parents were very much like they wanted to disown me at the time, but you know, most of their friends did not see any of my other classics, but they came to that like three, four or five times. Mm -hmm. Some people came 10 times. So it tells you when you find a story that resonates inside somebody's home, that's so strong, that, that stings you, that and you, you, you spared nothing to tell the truth. You get the crowd, they come out. You know, I want to talk a little bit, we'll, we'll kind of go into the structure because you, you mentioned um, benefit performance. As I'm listening in the past, over the past five weeks and in 
in re my own research into Jamaican theater, I'm getting a sense of the the business structure. What um what allows Jamaican artists to continue their work is heavily dependent on. Um, there's not a lot of government funding, um, and it's heavily dependent on either corporate or these um, benefit. Um, well, Sir Basley is the king of that. <laughs> yeah, right. And so that sometimes can limit your pen. But before we go into that, let's talk a little bit about language. Um, and when I talk about language, I'm not just speaking about language as whether or not um, English or Jamaican, or some people may call it Jama Jamaican Creole, or, you know, that's one part of language. But when I talk about language, I'm talking about what is the, um, what is the verbal attraction, cadence, um, shared en entrance into the collective consciousness, what we all know, what we all understand, because love him or leave him, Jamaican people know who Anansi is, whether we accept or reject Anansi. So when we talk about language, I think Anansi is a part of our language. Um, Carl O'Brien says that we are a Anansi nation in the chat. Um, so when, Basil, talk to us about the language of the Jamaican canon. Yes. Language for me is always a, a challenging thing. And the first thing you, you need to ask yourself is, who am I communicating to? Who am I speaking to? And what language must I use so that they can understand? Because I do have that obligation. But at the same time, you want to be authentic to the voices of your characters. And your characters, if they are Jamaican, they have to talk authentic Jamaican, but in a manner so that everybody else who has some modicum of English will understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm always challenged because my, my plays go, go to different countries. Some of them, English is not even their first choice. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, what I aim to do is to make sure that the sociocultural context of the situation is so understood that even if I use Rob and Jamaican Patwa, mm -hmm. the context in which it is set will communicate the feelings. And, and therefore, my, my, my aim is to be as communicative to the Australian, the South African, the wherever you come from, that you must understand the, the, the Jamaican-ness mm -hmm. of it. And I also understand the limitations too, because um, you will say, when you look at the Jamaican dance culture and the way it's widely accepted in Europe, in Japan, in, in China, in places where they don't even speak the language. Mm -hmm. But we have to be mindful of the fact that we don't have drum and bass. We are out there, our actors are out there on stage with their naked truth, and all they have is their language and movement. Mm -hmm. And we are not necessarily assisted with the pulsating rhythm of the dancer. So as a result, I think we have to always write with a sensitivity to being true to the essence of who we are, but understanding that we want the wider world to hear and understand and feel us. You know, it's interesting because um, a couple of weeks ago we had the Jamaican producers on and they too had th this conversation of language comes up when we talk about the wider world, the global Jamaican theater on a global platform. Um, you know, I think plays are traveling all over the world and, uh, you know, in every single language. Um, and writers are picking up stories from different corners of the globe and bringing it, bringing it into their culture. So when we think about, I, I, I push back a little bit when I, when I hear um, 
the need for the, the, the language to be clearly understood in its English form. And I'm more wondering, what is the opportunity? Fabian, what, Fabian and, and David or, or Basil, but what is the opportunity for audiences who are interested in culture or even those of us who are in the diaspora and we've been removed from the language for quite a while and we may even to be lost in, in, in some of the dialect. Um, what is the opportunity for somebody to lean in and to learn as far as language and Jamaica, and, and it could be in the ways of words, it could be movement, it could be cadence, um, intention. What are, what are the opportunities for, for people to look into how language is used in Jamaica? And even talking about African cosmology as you're mm. using Fabian, um, what are those opportunities for people looking in? Because I think it's one, yes, you do need to be adaptable, but technology is making things adaptable. Yes. The intellectual opportunity for people who are carrying into the Jamaican state. And I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Aki, because for me, I am like, look, and I say to, in, in, in my lectures, in talking, in working in cultural studies, but also coaching people, I say to them, why do people twang? Okay. So what because, is twang? Be, because, because. Break down twang, because, because now you're twang, speaking. Twang, we put up, you know, the, the, the my book is some people live in a country for years and years and they get the accent. Jamaicans get the accent on the way to the airport. <laughs> Before we reach, we say, well, um, I'm going to fire in. So you get this, 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 or you get this heavy, you know, with, with the Windrush generation who the thick English accent. So some twanging for me is you think something's wrong with the way you speak. So you're fixing it. Yeah. So somebody else can understand. And I said to people, you hear African people at all? You hear Spanish people at all? They talk, they talk. And if you catch it, you catch it. If you not catch it, you're lucky. And I'm saying, Jamaica, we should do the same. You can use subtitles. You can have translation, but people should hear the rhythm, the cadence, the pronunciation. When somebody say, Maka Jook me, mm. they say, What a way the girl sweet like her money. People must hear that rhythm. And sometimes even experiment. So I love to do things where we, we do the English, do, do the patois, then do the English. And we, and we with Tribes and Copa, we have the opportunity because we're doing all kinds of work. We're doing work that's written in a very Anglo English. We're doing things that are more colloquial. We're doing things in heavy patois. We're doing things in dancehall style. But we're also using music and rhythm and how we move. And I'm like, people should be able to experience it and kind of go, oh, this was difficult or, wow, I always say to people to pick up an accent. It's not about the speaker changing how they speak. It's about you adjusting how you listen. Because if you're used to a certain sound, that's the sound your ear is used to. Mm -hmm. But when a different sound enters the soundscape, you have to shift or pay more attention. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the rhythm and the movement. And you know, how do we move as Jamaicans? And that sound, I think is beautiful. One of the things, I'm a, I'm a patwa champion, and I struggle with the fact that I believe I might have to draw from my earphones because the rain starts falling where I am. Okay, okay. So rain is, I'm going for, I got my earphones now. Okay. That's Jamaica, sweet Jamaican rain, nothing like a December rain in Jamaica. Right? Jamaica, when, sadly, is still one of the, probably the only countries in the world that is still ashamed of its indigenous language. Okay, now talk the thing, talk the thing. It's nation language. We are still shaming people because they talk bad. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't go to school, she have sense. Why she talk like that? We're still putting sound bites on TV to make fun of people who are speaking funny. We, mm -hmm. we, still, we, we still have a nation that do, we are not honoring our language, the Jamaican language and its cadences and beauty. So people sometimes shame for talking. You know, the people tell you, well, people say, we don't, I'm not against Patois, you know, but it, it has its place. It's you know, when, when you think about what the language is, however, the fact that Jamaica is a convergence of so many different African peoples. Thank and you. that they had to form a way. Thank you. We weren't all the same people. We Thank you, my sister. We had to form a language so we could communicate, one, to get Thank ourselves you. off of the plantations. To Thank you. Because there was no way we could revolt if we couldn't talk to each other. We then had a language that we were not allowed to read, just like Thank many you. people in the um, in the New World. 
We were yes. not taught to read and write. So to you could lose your life. Frederick Douglass talks about that. Yeah. And so the fact that we even have formed this language, it's one that should be investigated and celebrated. I think I'm just going to bring David into the conversation here because you have your own take on the Jamaican language and its evolution as different cultures have come. So I would say you have your own take on the Jamaican language in the 20th and 21st century. Share with that and how does that language show up in your plays? So firstly, I want to say that I don't quite agree with Fabian. I was wondering where the disagreement was going to come from. But um, here it goes my first one. So okay. for me, it's different. Um, when you step into a room and the person who you want to converse with in a room starts to speak Spanish. Now, if you didn't do Spanish, um, you don't have a clue what is being said. Now, even to Jamaicans, the, the, the raw Creole, they don't understand it. They don't understand the language either. So it depends on who you are talking to. If I, if I am in a, if I'm around, no, 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 we'll have Fabian, we're, we're going to get there, right? We're going to get there. It depends on who you're talking to. Um, I, don't, I love the, the colorful language that we have, and I, I encourage it. It's in every single play that I have. Here's the thing. Um, when I write, because I'm coming from, my first degree was in literature in English. Um, when I write, I write in English, right? When we're directing it, um, I say, be Jamaican, right? You know what it's saying, the cow jumped over the moon, right? That's what it says in English. But if you want to say, the cow jump over the moon, and I'll kill you for that. Keep your accent, keep your everything, be Jamaican about it. When we travel, the promoter always comes to us and says, hey, remember, you know, then they don't understand where you are right now. So careful how much of it you go into. But I find that once we touch it, I mean, as an actor myself, being in the, in the play overseas, and you're trying to, oh, the cow jumped over the moon, you know, and trying to, the minute you said, Jano, the cow jump over the moon, you know, the place. And, and so, yeah, that's because that's what they're paying their money for. They're paying their you. money to hear thank a Jamaican play. So they thank want you. To the but, the <laughs> but, but the promoter is of the belief. This is the person who carry it up, you know. They're of the Run belief. The so, Pastor, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this but is the Akiva, yes, sir. The truth is, it is not required of you by the promoters overseas, and I've had to deal, I know exactly what David is doing. I've been dealing with it 30 years before David. <laughs> um, the truth is, they are concerned that if you are going to speak the Patois, the Jamaican, speak it slower, mm. so that the people have time to translate it. And they will get it, but you can't be rattling it off and going on to another thing and another thing, because they're not they have to have time to interpret and they will get it. So, but we as, as Jamaican producers, we are very sensitive about the time of the run of our play. And if it's a two hour play, we want it to finish in two hours. We don't want it to be two hours, 10 minutes. But you have to make that allowance. If you are going to stay authentic to the language is to be aware that most of the people in, in that 1800, they, they don't they don't know it. Many of them, they, 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 although they're Jamaican and they claim Jamaican and they even try to talk like Jamaican, when they're hearing it coming at them at rapid fire, they're not under, and they get frustrated and, and they complain about it. I know that. But it does not require you to necessarily change anything that is authentic, but you have to, you can keep the rhythm, but just slow it down a little. So here's the thing now, Akiva. I, uh, hold on, I, hold on, hold on, David. Let me, let me talk to you. So, so this is where I differ from both David and Basil. Because even when we are performing for Jamaican audience on stage, you have to slow down your speech. So people can hear it anyway. So you're not going to... Because gabbling, clarity. So the same attention to the classical things of performing and performing and not just casual talk is the same thing for any audience but when you know slow it down and so we, here's what we have happening in jamaica people come to jamaica they show things in jamaica with jamaican accent and I with jamaican accent and telling that you sound to jamaican i say run them, run run them. them. nobody's like telling the african said, people and not and it's not even that they're talking thick because i'm talking jamaican actors 
who right. speak yeah. standard Jamaican English, mm -hmm. who are not speaking in a St. Elizabeth accent, have put people who come from foreign telling them, you know, that was great, but you know, could you could you sound more Anglo? Because the audience we're going for is, are they doing that for their product? Are they telling Indian people you sound too Indian? Are Indian. they telling the, the African soap operas that we are gobbling up, that right. have subtitles? And we, what generations is one of the biggest things in Jamaica. There's an Indian soap opera with a little Indian girl that the Jamaican teens love it because it is authentic. But we in Jamaica, and I'm not saying Basil and David, there's a tendency to say, make we slow it down. Let us not have it so heavily, but it is Jamaican. So we Fabian, are Jamaican. Fabian, I, I'd, like to, ahead, I'd like to say something here, Akiba. Yeah. The, the question is not that it is not already in a performance rhythm here in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. What is required overseas is to even slow it down a little more. Right. And who is perfect and good at that? With all the clarity and everything is Oliver Samuels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody yeah. overseas don't hear him or don't understand what he says. And he's not that, he isn't aware that he's going authentic, but he does it at a pace and a rhythm that it allows for everybody to understand it. Because uh, Akiva, we have different rehearsals when we're touring, you know. Once the run is in Jamaica, it's closed. The minute the tour starts, we have two weeks of rehearsal for that separately because it's- Adapted it's, to the foreign state. Right, right. Because it, 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 you you have to make a deal. Okay, yeah, where I might say, hold on, Fabia, where I might say something that the nowadays, like you said, on the streets, the nowadays people know immediately, what up, man? You might get it. When I go overseas, I go and make something out of that what up, man, because so that they get it. Because you remember, they've been away from the country for a while. So you have to kind of have a class while you're while you are doing your performance. So I'm going to reintroduce what that man to you and you're going to get it because I'm going to do it about five yeah. times in this show. Right. So when I go, what that man? You don't have to wait and give them a chance to laugh. They're going to turn to them friend and say, what that man? What That's cute. Exactly. You know, whatever it is. But you're making a good point here because we, if we're listening to the conversation from day one, you know, when you, I'm glad you bring up Oliver. Um, it's not unusual for a, a Jamaican or another person from the Caribbean or a non-Jamaican to go and see or a non-Caribbean person to see Oliver because the way that Oliver handles language rhythm, syncopation, pacing. He brings you into the language in a way mm. in his performance. We also heard that from Shibata. Mm -hmm. Shibata talks about how he used language and that moment of teaching, that moment of presentation. Right. Well, he's very good Fabian, at it too. Yeah, Fabian, you talk about another element of the Jamaican stage being the removal or the smashing of the fourth wall. That's mm -hmm. another of language because when audience can come can communicate with what's on the stage there's that mm -hmm. ab ability to access and and we know that some theaters some people go to the theater and they like to sit quietly and listen to yes. the stage of play but the theater, <laughs> you know, theater. Some like to, <laughs> to laugh and talk back so i want to go into um you know there we have Al althea charlene she says we that have left Jamaica for years, sometimes she's agreeing with what you're saying here, David, um, that it's sometimes difficult to understand. However, we that have left Jamaica for years, we go to the theater to brush up on our Jamaica. Hey. We go to the theater to find out what I'm <laughs> you know, I, I dance out to find out what's the language, all the people that I talk, all the things that go. Yeah. Pre. I just learned that word the other day. What's the pre? You yeah, know? pre. We are pre. So, 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 Akiva, not to cut you, but that's it. So, as writers, and I know Sir Basil does it too, but when we're going overseas, we, we have to bear that, that a tour is coming up at the end of our local run. So, we try to write a script that educates the diaspora overseas that here's what you've missed. 
over the year that you have not seen us. Because yeah. I go up maybe four or five times for the year. And I have to remember that Florida is different from Atlanta, is different from London. And I did that in London last year. So I can't go back to London again with it this year. I have to come something else. Because you, you have to teach them. You don't know what's the latest in the dancehall culture. You don't know what's the latest in the middle class. So you try to do a little package so that you get a little bit of everything. And so, Kiban, I think this is an important difference in approach and style. Mm -hmm. So I don't do that. Okay. I don't. I don't fix a version for Atlanta and Germany and school. So you try and cope. when I do a play, I rehearse it in the context that there are Jamaicans who don't understand patois. Right. That there are Jamaicans who when come to the play who don't understand some words in standard English. So I am already rehearsing for a diverse audience in terms of language. Mm. And so it's pitched that way and rehearsed that way so that wherever we go with a play, with a poem, wherever, wherever we go, go do a learn, I go do this poem, it has to do the same way. Mm -hmm. And wherever we go to do a dub poem, it has to do the same way. Now, what we might add is a conversation or a discussion after the performance. But I don't get into the, oh, I'm, I'm changing it for the tour. So for me, there's what, what, the work that I do, there's not a tour version and a Jamaican version. There's, this is the work. Or and look at, hold on, we might have some contemporary things that people might not get. So when we did um, the Lorna Goodison edition of Word Soul in Barbados, mm -hmm. we didn't change it. We, we, we rehearsed it, but we didn't change the language and the cadences for that audience. And this is how, this is how it sounds. So it's just a difference in approach. Mm -hmm. And maybe because of the kind of work that tribes and Cover, it gives us more of that leeway. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not changing things because we're going to Atlanta and because we're going to London. This is the piece, this is what I rehearsed, and this is the story, here's what we're presenting. Fabian, your work is reminding me of the ancient Greek theater, where it was more about, because you know there are people who, in that time, the language wasn't written, because if you think about that time, mm -hmm. you think about what is a language. Language is verbal, and it's, lit it's written, right? And so if you think about as languages were being formed, even in the allegorical theaters of the medieval, medieval allegorical the um, theater of, theaters of Europe, these languages, the common man, the, the average man that was at a Shakespeare, Shakespeare play was not reading and writing anything. Mm -hmm. okay? True. <laughs> so how was language being formed? How is language being formed? And how is it landing on people? And that's where you see these performative elements being yeah. very vivid. And that's one of the reasons why we would even say that some of the pop culture plays and the roots theater is so successful because they're heavy on performance. They're heavy on farce. And they're not as cerebral, um, even though they have a lot of social commentary. We're moving on to the, almost the end of our time together. And so what I want to do is to ask, where does the Jamaican theater, where does the work that you do as playwrights, where does language, where, where does everything that we have this, we've, we're talking about at this time, if we think of 2020 and COVID, Mm. a portal, a gateway. What are we walking through this gateway with? Um, and what? how does your work come out on the other end? What are you taking with you from this COVID time, this time where the world is saying we must change, we want to change, we want to do better? Let me jump in quickly. So for Trans and COVID, it was a transformative period for us mm -hmm. because I realized that COVID was going to be here for a while. So I actually auditioned five new members for Tribes and COVID virtually. That was the first time. We, we had our meetings virtually. We, had, we started to go through repertoire with the new members online. And then we said, are we going to do a season? So we did our first virtual season in August. Two different nights, sold tickets on Eventbrite. And then we got funding from Kingston Creative to be part of their last Sunday. And then we just recently got catapult funding through Kingston Creative, yeah. American Friends of Jamaica, and we did another showcase. So now we're into, we have recorded work. We now have audio clips that we, we're now amassing because this is going to be for the long haul. So it really is about, that's where the box, that's, what is this box of which you speak? Because all these things we had access to before COVID, but in our mind was your rent a theater. Mm -hmm. going to a theater and perform for a Jamaican audience and then maybe your tour. Mm -hmm. We can now say our season from the beginning, we are pitching for people in Germany to be able to see it because even if we're in a theater, we're live streaming. Mm -hmm. 
So it's opened up this other world of make we open up the thing. Like I said, I sat in my living room and watched Alien, watched National Theatre of, 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 of London. So for me, that really said it has completely changed the way we see ourselves in Tribes and Kofa, but also the world. And also for myself as a writer, it's like there, there is no box, there's no separation, there's nothing we don't have access to. And it's now about break, thinking along that and creating in that line that I am creating for an international audience. And I may, you know, and do have easier access to Jamaica, but the world is at our feet. So for me as an artist, but also for Tribes and Kofa, that, that's the gift of COVID for us. Mm. What about for you, David? What is, what is, what is COVID, um, what are you taking? What are you leaving behind? What is the well, it, it made me, I keep, I think about a lot of things, um, mainly longevity and where we are in the public space. I'm also a, an adjudicator for JCDC as well. Mm -hmm. And every year when I go and I look and I see, uh, we're doing the same old points from when I was in primary school. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, I'm saying, so what's my contribution to that right now? And it's simply the fact that um, I don't think we're published enough. So I'm, I'm taking the other route now because my belief is it may be three, maybe four years before live theater becomes prominent again. Mm -hmm. And so let's not waste the time. Um, I uh, I'm on the CSEC syllabus as a as a as an as a playwright. Um, CSEC because you're giving terms that those who live in Jamaica. Oh, would sorry. Have. So they would have known it at CXC back in the day, right? It's now the the CSEC examination. It's a, it's an entrance exam or for, senior Cambridge. Yeah, Cambridge. <laughs> they would have known it at. at uh, uh, elementary or primary. No, grade eleven. Grade eleven. Grade okay. eleven. So, to get to college? Right. High school, yeah, high school. Good. Right. So what what I'm on that syllabus and I'm also studied in the university. I have three plays in the university right now. But the students are reading from a PDF file. You know what I mean? Um it's thing it's time now to look at things like Sir Basley who has, has done his great book of his plays. Um I think a lot of us as writers now need to pay back our contribution because we've been commercially involved we now need to go on the back end and, and supply supply what we have not been supplying over the years so that at least the literature of right. our work is being preserved um whether or not we're performing them or not and um it's also given us a chance to film some of them as i spoke to some very prominent people overseas who i don't want to name right now but they and they said to me look you're sitting down now doing nothing Turn your plays into films, not necessarily movies. Just do a filmed version of your play, right? So at least longevity is there, whether or not. Because if you die tomorrow, um, God forbid, um, what, where, where do you go for a David Tuller? How do we find you? So you're looking at publishing. And one of the benefits of publishing, especially when you're able to get your plays into the classroom curriculum, you are then educating uh, the generations to come up because they're studying these plays, they're learning language and comprehension by studying Jamaican plays by Jamaican playwrights, not just studying Shakespeare, not just studying August Wilson and Lorraine Hansberry, but they're able to learn how to read, write, speak, be in the world by studying your work. Basil, what- Hold on one second, just before you move on. the time, hold, let's hold, because of time, I do want to move to Basil. And oh, now, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Yep, go ahead. I, I, I have used this period as a period of introspection, a period of self-study. I am in fact looking at what options do I do I take? How could I, how can I be more productive once this COVID-19 is over? How could I be of service to a generation that follows? Uh, there's always the issue of the inability to get a theater space. Now, the digital technology is allowing us to do some things, but I am thinking that the medium has to be addressed in terms of, the, I, I don't necessarily want to look at just picking something off a live stage and just live streaming. I want to know what are the rudiments, what, what are the aesthetics that are required now for streaming because we're going into a new world and I want to go in at a level where we don't come off 
amateur amateurishan and 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 the excellence can still be maintained so that's where i am now so essentially i'm doing nothing that is outwardly productive everything for me now is internal in this time i'm using this space to educate myself amazing well you know we've been getting the the um the the chat is definitely lighting lighting up here and um, the conversation is is kind of setting off. You set your audience off with this conversation on language. We have um, Chris Alid, who's been joining us, I think, from week one. She points out that in a the 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 novel Yardi was made into a movie. Actually, it's one of my favorite novels. And where we see Idris Elba, um, did he did not do subtitles for for the Jamaican parts of the language and he played it as what well as it was. And so that's one thing that's coming up. Um, Basil, you have quite a fan in the audience um, mm -hmm. who, who, who's um, toy boy, she exclaims, is one of her favorite um, plays of all time. Um, and that is Patricia mm -hmm. Reed, uh, Patricia Reed Way. It says oh, Toy Boy yeah. is one of her favorite plays of all time. It is. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad that we we went into this conversation about language because I think as we wrap up, as we close out, I do think that language is going to be something that on the other side of COVID, we as creatives around the world, we are going to investigate language um, um, very very deeply, you know, whether the Tower of Babel is falling down or we're building new language structures, because we talk about language, we also talk about the virtual space, right? And we talk about being able to, to make it work inside of the virtual space. So how does language even show up in that space? I keep, um, it's not a one-to-one -one trans, um, it's not a one-to-one -one translation, so to speak, to make a virtual um, event work really well. So this has been an incredible conversation. It's only part one. Next week, we are entering into part two. Um, we will continue. Please feel free to continue the conversation in the chat. Share your um, perspectives on language, on the story of the Jamaican people. What plays have you seen? But next week, we go into part two of the Jamaican Playwrights, where we will speak with the great Dahlia Harris. We will be speaking with Lana Finnegan, uh, one of the co-founders of Sistrin. Um, I, I call it Sister in Theater Movement. And we are also going to be um, speaking with Suzanne Beadle. So do join us next week at 4 p.m. Eastern time here on our YouTube channel and also on HowlRound.com. And Jamaican people have a saying, we say walk good. And we walk actors, good. we say see you on the boards. So walk good on the boards no matter what the language you speak. <laughs> blessings, blessings. Blessings. Thanks.